Got a couple quick things just to uh, remind you about, uh, re-emphasize. One is men's breakfast coming up this Saturday. Uh, generally, it's always going to be the third Saturday of the month, so that is this coming Saturday. Uh, so I hope you're able to make it for that. I send out an email thing to the men that I have your email for. If you're not getting that, then let me know and I will sign you up. It's always delicious. It's always fun. Um, always marvel at... Uh, you know, how deep the, uh, the sharing is and experience is there. So hope you hope you come to that. Uh, then another plug for this interfaith meal, and I hope that you'll uh, use the clue-in sheet to let us know if you're going to come to this. This is a really cool thing that we're doing. Um, a good, good step forward in terms of creating a, a space for dialogue that is much needed in our country that is so divided along the lines of religion. So if you want to come to this, um, it's going to be pretty easy to do. All you got to do is come up. Uh, eat some soup <laughs> and share with people around your table. And there will be an exercise that we'll go through with different leaders of these different uh, faith communities uh, in Napa, and I'll be uh, one of those. So anyway, should be very cool. And I think we're being honored as a church um, on behalf of the other uh, communities of faith and Bragg Wagon Connect uh, with a tree uh, that's going to be part of what we do next week uh, to remember the way that the church stepped up and served uh, during the fires, which is very cool. So uh, anyway, that'll be, that'll be fun. So I hope you make it to that. And one cool thing uh, that I, I don't remember Barb uh, bleh, Dar saying is tonight, uh, this is a very cool twist on our, uh, on our Thanksgiving meal, which is already good. We got Bob Sheets in the house tonight, folks. Do you remember seeing Bob? Uh, we brought him in last spring. He's right here. He is an internationally renowned magician, and uh, he will blow your mind. So um, that's coming. If you haven't signed up to come for that, it's kid-friendly stuff. He only swears two or three times in the whole act. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but he does some cool stuff with kids as well, and they will be floored uh, as well. So come tonight, and that's going to be uh, the, one of the cool features of this evening. So it will be awesome. I guarantee it. All right, so let's bring up my stuff. Uh, Chris, today I'm going to be talking about remembering religion. Remembering religion. We live in a time when religion is sort of apparently, in our culture anyway, on the way out. Uh, the people are wanting less to do with religion. Uh, so actually in the United States, uh, there's a new category for people who are leaving religion altogether. They're called the nuns. N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. And it refers to um, data that goes out, surveys that ask them, what is your religious affiliation instead of Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist, they check the box that says none. It is the fastest growing religious group in the United States. As all of the other traditions are losing numbers, that one is rising fast. There was a song back in the 90s, some of you might remember it, Losing My Religion. And a lot of people resonated with that song uh, for different reasons. But my hunch is that folks have had a harder time dealing with religion because when we think about religion, we quickly think of the worst faces of religion. We think about the Crusades. Uh, we think about Hitler's World War II and using the Bible uh, to do great things, well, in his mind, great things to wipe out entire people groups. Uh, we think much more close and personal for some. Uh, people that I know uh, that have either been deeply wounded physically and emotionally uh, by members of the clergy or by key leaders in church who used the trust that they had and the power that they had to do what they wanted to do and then kept them quiet with that same power and title. That's awful stuff. And so maybe that's where you're at. In fact, I've even had families uh, come to me, parents come to me, and um, being folks that have sort of taken a step away from religion and not wanting to hurt their children by teaching them a religion. Uh, they've made a decision not to bring their kids to church, not to do anything to introduce their children to faith whatsoever because they don't want to harm them. What an interesting thing. What an interesting place we've come to. And maybe they're right. There's a lot of hate-mongering going on in churches. There's a lot of infighting. 
So maybe that's what we should do. And for you parents, I'm going to be speaking really close to you today, but then for everybody I'm speaking to, because we all influence other people, right? And so maybe we should just do away with religion. Maybe that's really the answer uh, that we're looking for. And I, I'd have to agree with you. Unless, for our children, if we care about their self-image, their physical health, their emotional health, their financial health, their relational health, the ability for them to live at peace with themselves and others, their future parental health, their capacity to balance life's challenges, their ability to have hope in the face of difficult times, their capacity to handle grief well and to develop in a deep and abiding love of other people. If you want those things for your children, then what I want to tell you is that religion, what it's supposed to be, facilitates all those things. And to turn our back on religion when the goal or the, the product of religion, one of those things, is the beauty of life itself in all of its fullness and depth. <laughs> what parent would want to deny their kid that? So that's what I'm going with on remembering religion. And I'm playing a little bit of a a trick on you with the title here because really you're looking at two words which essentially, while you may not recognize it right now, are saying the same thing. The reason I asked you about the joint thing um, is because religion, if you break it down, really comes from the two words that would translate as re-ligament. Re-ligament. To bring back together and remembering, if you think about that, remembering is bringing back together. When we think about remembering a story, we are remembering things that happen into our now so that they are still a part of us. Religion at its best is bringing it back together, making it more whole. That's what religion is supposed to be doing. Not about a list of doctrine and dogma in and of itself, but with a goal of bringing back together, re-ligamenting. And so, uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you have sprained an ankle? Wow, poor people. How many of you have uh, sprained a wrist, perhaps? All right, how about this one? How many of you have uh, thrown a shoulder, uh, dislocated a shoulder? Oh, a few of you. Ah, I hear it hurts, is that right? Um, who was it, Mel Gibson? What movie was it where he, uh, he had to get out of a straitjacket or something uh, by popping his shoulder out? You remember that? Is it, what is it? Is it Lethal Weapon? Was that the movie? Yeah, right. And it did not look like a pleasant experience for him when he popped his shoulder <laughs> out and then popped it back in. Uh, imagine living your whole life uh, walking around with a twisted ankle that doesn't quite heal or a sprained wrist that never gets unsprained, or a shoulder that's out of joint. Imagine that kind of pain that you walk around with. Religion, if you can get here with me, is about relieving those things, about putting those things back where they're supposed to be so that you live with less pain, not more. And so as I'm talking today, I'm going to take us to a passage of Scripture. Psalm 78 is where we're looking uh, today. And let's just mow through this because you're going to hear um, instructions about our kids and what are we doing for the next generation. And it has a lot to do with remembering. So the psalmist says, Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his own laws, his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. And I think this last part is very interesting. I want you to hold on to this. Then they will not be like their ancestors, 
stubborn, rebellious, and unfruitful, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. The reason I think that's interesting, and if you have a pretty good chunk of time to read the rest of Psalm 78 because it's long, a lot of it is recounting that last little passage, the way they got it wrong so that they wouldn't fall into the same traps. It's really interesting. They're telling stories on themselves about their own failures and their own faith tradition. Remember that, because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. And reading this this week, it reminded me of two other key verses in Scripture. So on the next slide, we've got from uh, Luke 2.52. Uh, this is before Jesus starts his uh, adult ministry. So it tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. What I love about this, this picks, look, gives us a model for what we're shooting for. So we're, we want to grow in wisdom. So the people that uh, we're in charge of or influencing, we want them to become more wise. We want them to become stronger as people. And we also want them to grow in favor with God, means they're in step with God, but also in favor with other people. I think a mark for Jesus' followers had better be that they look and talk a lot like Jesus, that they're graceful like Jesus. Kind of makes me wonder when we see people who are hateful in the name of Jesus, are we really seeing the face of Jesus at that point? When we see people who are categorically uh, denying uh, entire people groups, are we really seeing the mark of Jesus at that point? Now, well, this is the picture that we see. And we know that for all but those in power, uh, until the end of his life, uh, he was highly regarded by people, and still is. Proverbs 22, 6. I'm using the amplified version here, and the reason I'm using this is it flushes it out more. Uh, you get to see a little bit under the hood of the Hebrew language with this. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. I love that, so it's personalized. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, a lot of people have built their lives on this verse and done everything right with their kids, and then their kids run amok. Uh, Proverbs are not 100% um, true promises. It's not the way to think about Proverbs. Proverbs are general truths that if you do this, it's going to have this effect. And so what the proverb writer is saying is, you do this thing in the right kind of a way, it's going to be a good thing for your children. And they're probably going to keep on in the tradition that you've started. So to talk about these things, I'm going to tell stories from my own uh, childhood. Because my parents uh, did some things that, as I was reflecting this week, they did a lot of things really right. And I just want to talk about my story a little bit, really their story. And to get there, we're going to need to talk about RSVP tomorrow and next Sunday. Oh, go back a slide. Backwards. There we go. On the bottom there, we're going to talk about RSVP tomorrow, next Sunday, prom 1986. And Oldsmobile 1988, or an Oldsmobile 88, it's actually 1983 is one we're going to look at. Uh, a Guild Girls, Bulldozer, and The Closet. All right, so now let's go to the next screen, Chris, for RSVP. At a very early age, both of my parents made a decision. They both were given an invitation. And the invitation that they were both given um, was simply this to follow Jesus. And they both said yes to that invitation at a very young age. And I'm sure that the way that that was presented to them was, you have choices in the way you're going to live your life and how you're going to connect with God, uh, how you're going to think about everything. Jesus is saying, come and follow me. And it's going to go well. It's going to be, it's going to be the healthiest way to experience God, life, the whole thing. And both of them, uh, in their households, they looked at their parents, who were, in each case, uh, deeply faithful Christian people, and it just totally made sense to them. And so both of my parents at an early age said yes to this following Jesus thing. And what they later would discover is that one yes led to a whole bunch of other yeses down the pike. It all starts with a choice. It all starts with an invitation to recognize, one, that personally we need to be re-ligamented, that our culture needs to be re-ligamented, that our world needs to be re-ligamented with each other and with God, and that there's a yes that helps us get to that. So they both said yes to this thing. And because they said yes to that, that led to the next slide, which is 
Sunday and tomorrow morning. So one of the things about Sunday uh, that I want to share with my folks, and by the way, the stories I'm telling, uh, my wife grew up in an almost identical household. So the stuff I'm talking to you about is stuff that she grew up with as well, and so I'm going to see lots of resonating uh, from her today. Um, we live in a different culture today. I, I don't know if it's because we are, part of it's a good thing, um, that we live in a much more free, accepting culture. Uh, there's a wonderfulness in that and a freedom in that. But, you know, when I grew up, when I was a little kid, especially in a small town in Kansas, uh, Sunday meant the whole town shut down so that you would go to church. It's like everybody knew, of course everybody's going to go to church. So all the businesses except for the gas stations by the freeways uh, were shut down. Now, there's kind of a legalistic thing involved here. I don't know if you catch that. Sort of a have to. You have to go to church. And actually, in our culture, uh, it was advised by corporate leaders that their corporate leadership uh, would attend church as soon as they moved into a new community because it was automatically assumed that good people went to church. And if you weren't going to church and a member of a church somewhere, it reflected poorly on you and the company. So my dad, who was a pastor of a suburban church in Kansas City, that's exactly what he saw. Every year, a whole new host of executives would come into his church to join the church because that's what good executives do. Well, that's shifted in our culture now. Sunday's no longer sacred, and any number of things can happen on Sunday with no backlash whatsoever. In fact, if anything, uh, you may get pushed back the other way, where people invite you to do whatever on a Sunday morning. If, if you say, oh, no, I can't, I've got to go to church, then they might look at you funny, whereas in the past, it might be the other way around. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of a reality today. But for my family growing up, church was never, I mean, my dad was a pastor, so that is kind of a cheat. <laughs> and both of, uh, both of our parents, actually, Lynn's dad was also a pastor. But I want to tell you that the Sunday thing for us was never a, a negotiable thing. It was never a legalistic thing like, oh, you better or else. It wasn't that. It was just, this is who we are. We said yes to Jesus at an early age. And that yes to Jesus then uh, took us toward a lot of yeses down the line. And one of those yeses it's led to is we're a family that does church. We just do that. And that actually gave us a boundary that in retrospect was very helpful. Because it was no longer a question of, well, how many beers did I drink Saturday night that I wasn't supposed to be? Or how late did I stay out or whatever? Because maybe if I went too far, got in too late, then, ah, oh, well, you know, maybe Peter can sleep in. No, that was never the case. Unless I had a temperature over 100, I was going. You know, that was kind of the rule in the house. But it was, I got to emphasize again, it was not about a legalistic tick-the-box thing. It was, this is our culture, and why? Because they understood that coming together as community coming together to learn, to worship, to be together, to serve together, to grow together. That's a part of it. And when you slice that part off, when you slice off that connection, you slice off way more than you probably could ever imagine. So my folks never sat down with us kids around the table and detailed out, this is why we go to church on Sunday. They didn't have to. Because faith is more caught than taught. This was a part of our ethos. It was a part of who we are as people who follow Jesus. And doing that re-ligamented us to each other. We had this shared experience, and we had a shared experience with the community of faith, and we had a shared experience with the community of faith and with God all the way around. But it wasn't just Sunday. There's also tomorrow morning, and every tomorrow morning, and my mom never had to make an announcement, never had to say, hey kids, uh, I'm going to do my devotional time right now. She never had to say it because we knew what she was doing. When she was with her book, she usually was reading a book, had her Bible there, and would spend some time in prayer as she saw her parents do. This became normal. <laughs> She was connecting with God. Our family was connecting together on Sunday, and we saw my mother, because my dad was already out uh, going to work, and he was doing it his own way, but we would see my mom and hear her talk about what she was reading and what she was reflecting on, because she was making an intentional yes to deepen her walk with God. We learned that that's how you do it. It was caught, not taught. We never were given an extra dollar 
well, we were never given a dollar, but if we would have given a dollar, <laughs> uh, we never would have gotten one for doing our devotionals. It was never like that. There was never an extra star or a piece of chocolate. It was, well, if you say yes to Jesus, if you're in a relationship with God, you're going to deepen that relationship with God. And so, of course, you're going to go to church on Sunday. And, of course, you're going to spend some time, you know, alone in prayer and meditation and study. Of course. I mean, that's what you do when you're in a relationship with someone. So that was one thing that I learned early, just catching it from them. I just caught it, that this connection thing matters. The next thing that we see on the next slide. This is Lynn and I prom 1986. Well, no, it isn't. We didn't meet till college, so. <laughs> but I thought, you know, that's kind of close to what we may have looked like if we'd have gone. Lynn had the, the monster 80s hair going uh, back in the day, and I looked like an idiot most of the time, so that, uh, that works out pretty good. But I want to tell you about Prom 1986 as it pertains to the issue of grace. My parents never sat us down around the dinner table, never had a family meeting to, to talk to us, to walk us through um, what grace is all about because they just simply lived it. It's 1986, high school prom. I was a sophomore in high school. I shouldn't have even gone to prom. But because my girlfriend was a junior, I got a ticket. My girlfriend and I were real serious. We'd been together three whole months. So, you know, it's love. <laughs> and so we go to the prom, and I knew all along that uh, my girlfriend, Debbie, uh, whose mother my parents knew, she was the drama director at the high school. I was deep into theater stuff. So there was high trust there, and we knew that after prom was over, after the dance was over, everybody was going to pile back to Debbie's house, and we are going to hang out for a while, eat some chips, watch some movies, all through the night. It was going to be an all-nighter. And then we would end our prom experience... Uh, with breakfast the next morning and then roll back to bed at our own homes and carry on. That's what I knew the plan was. So when my folks said, we want you home by 1 a.m., I just said, I'm going to do the best I can. I had no intention of being home at 1 a.m. I didn't want to miss out. I didn't want to disappoint uh, my girlfriend or my friends who were also in the prom party. So I stayed out all night. I didn't get home late as much as I got home early the next morning. So whatever it was, 7 a.m. or so, I come into the house. And normally at 7 a.m. on a weekend, uh, my folks would probably still be asleep. Not that day. Both of them sitting in the living room waiting for me to come through the front door. Awful. So let me tell you what happened next. Let me tell you what they did not do. They did not stand up and puff out their chests and tell me what an irresponsible idiot I was and how they were so angry with me for lying to their face. They did not yell. They did not scream. They did not threaten. They saw me come in. They knew I knew what was going on. And they just said, what happened? And so I told them, no, no big deal, no big deal. We were just at Debbie's house. Nothing was going on. There was a group of us. Everything's cool. There's no drinking, no, no nothing. No future little Debbie Peter running around. Nothing, nothing going on. It's all cool. But it didn't matter. Now that I've had two kids and raised them through high school, I can only imagine what they thought of. Now, my dad probably, he was just ticked off that he didn't get a good night's sleep. But my mom, who probably kept him awake all night, knowing that I was out, she's probably wondering, is he in a ditch? Did he get in a car with somebody who was drunk? Did he get abducted by aliens, taken to another planet, pureed into Soylent Green? It's possible. <laughs> Parents think crazy things. And I have a hunch it tore my mom up all night. And then when I finally walk in the door, it was probably a mixture of, thank God, he's in one piece and appears to be healthy and not drunk or hungover, uh, to one of deep disappointment. And so they let me know that. And as uh, they let me know that this was... Uh, 
a horrible breach of trust, not raising their voices, but just letting me know that they were disappointed and expected more of me. Uh, as I went downstairs into my bedroom, my mom caught me just as I was heading downstairs. I'll never forget it. And she said, Peter, it takes just a second to blow trust, but a long time to rebuild it. I hope you rebuild it. And then I was grounded. I was grounded for an appropriate time. In fact, when I turn 50, I'm finally ungrounded uh, from that moment. <laughs> Just three more years, and I get to drive Dad's car again. I can't wait. <laughs> my point here is, is my, my parents showed what grace looks like in that moment. Uh, they did not make a new problem to deal with uh, by blowing their tops, by escalating the thing. They made sure that I was held accountable, there was consequence, and there was a road map that they gave me. It kind of reminded me of Jesus and the woman uh, caught in adultery. You know, where Jesus does not rip her apart. Let's, she knows she's, she's busted. That's why she's there, why she was thrown at his feet as a pawn. Uh, but Jesus made it crystal clear, um, God has not condemned you either. Go and leave your life of sin. And so with me, it was like my mom was saying just that in a calm tone, not yelling. Never, ever, ever heard my parents yell at me. Uh, so I learned that that's what, that's what that yes to Jesus meant in this scenario. That yes to Jesus at that early age translated not just a yes to Jesus and I'm going to make church, I'm going to do this devotional thing to worship and understand who God is, uh, but I'm also, when it comes time for me to hold somebody accountable, it's going to be completely bathed in grace because that's who Jesus is. And you know what else? They never held it over my head after that. Never brought it up. And they sure could have. The next moment of trust, they could have said, well, we remember prom. The next prom, they could have said, remember last prom. They never did that. And I think that was a mark of grace. Well, so that was that. And it was a caught thing. They never taught us about it. They just did that. And they did that for all of us kids in our own respective ways, with our own respective foibles growing up. The next thing that we're going to look at Oh, yeah, this is a beauty. You're looking at a 19, I think I, I dialed up a 1983, 1984 Oldsmobile 88 Royale. Now I'm talking people, right? I mean, this is a beautiful ride if I've ever seen one. Crushed velvet seats in the interior. You got that beautiful vinyl covering on the back. This is the car that my dad drove when he was uh, uh, president of the university and then later on as executive minister in Michigan. The reason that's significant is that the Olds 98. Does anybody remember Oldsmobile, by the way? All right. So uh, R.E. O. R. E. Olds was a Christian man who was a member of the church that ordained me in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, that's why it's Oldsmobile, because it's after R.E. Olds. Well, anyway, in Michigan, my dad had to drive GM or, or Ford for sure. So he was a Chevy guy, and so uh, he drove uh, this Olds uh, 88 uh, a lot of time, then moved on to Buick and other things. But what I want to tell you is that my dad, if he'd, had, if he'd had decided on a different answer to, to the following Jesus, yes, he could have been driving the Oldsmobile 98. There's a big difference between the 88 and the 98. The old's 98. Now that's almost a Cadillac. That is a sweet ride. My senior prom, my dad had a Buick, whatever he was driving at that point, but my buddy, his dad had the 98. Guess which car we took to prom? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a sweet ride. So why didn't my dad do it? Well, he didn't do it because he didn't have the money. Well, that's actually not quite right. He chose to not have the money. My parents, yes, at that early age, to, took them to a yes to cause them to stretch their thinking about an area that is near and dear to our hearts. 
called personal finance. What they do with their money. And so my parents had this decision to make. We were solidly middle class my whole life. I don't know what it's like to be anything but middle class. Uh, that's what I am now. And that's kind of where, where we live. That's where we navigated through life. And that means that you got enough money to get by to pay your rent and a little extra uh, to help pay for college and saving or whatever the case may be. So that was our lifestyle, which meant that my parents had a little bit more uh, than were, was necessary just to meet the basic expenses. But they made a commitment to support what God was doing in the world with their money. Now some call that, if you grew up in church, that's called the tithe. It's like a budgeted amount. I'm going to give a certain amount every month to the church because that's what I want to do, it's what I believe, it's what I'm about. And that's what my parents did. And they never stopped. And they still do. Uh, what that meant was that probably back in the 1980s, I'm going to guess that that tithe from there on their parts, this is going back a while, I'm going to guess that their tithe check was somewhere around two to $300 a month that they were giving to the work of God in the church. Two to $300 a month, what is that going to do for a car payment? Well, that's the 98 baby. Or that's an extra thousand square foot on your home. Or that's moving to a little bit better neighborhood up the road. But my parents didn't do that because they said that yes so early on. And I knew that saying that yes there meant that they had to read ligament to bring back together all parts of their lives under the scope of God and by the leadership of the Spirit, which meant that even their checkbook, even their financial planning was going to be affected by that one yes. And part of that yes was, my money is not my own. I'm a stewardship of my life, my resources, everything. God is calling us to do something in the world. What am I going to do with the resources I have to make a difference? And so that was a regular part of it. Regular giving. But then now and again, um, they would do these offerings. Offerings, if you really want to know the vernacular, tithing is that regular thing you're going to do no matter what. That's a budgeted amount. You keep it up. It, it affects us personally when we do it. It like reorients our mind when we, when we set that up. It's, it's, it's a deeply spiritual thing that actually does work in mysterious ways, not in profound like do this and it's going to get your magic wish kind of a thing, but it reorients how you think about life when you orient it this way with your ledger. Offerings, on the other hand, are these one-offs that you do now and again. So if we have a guest speaker come in and say, oh man, we've got to get behind this, and he's like, all right, an extra 20 or 50 or 100 bucks today, I can do that. That's an offering. Well, I remember there was one particular year, it was after my grandmother died on my dad's side, and they came into a little bit of money. Uh, I don't know how much money, uh, not a ton of money, but money that we didn't used to have. And it was coming around to uh, our church's mission banquet uh, at that time. And that particular year, <laughs> the church raised $10,000 more than it would have because my dad sliced off a big hunk of that inheritance to the mission field. Now, they did it anonymously. They didn't want all these accolades, uh, name recognition and all that. But they told us kids, what does that do to a kid? On the one hand, it could make you a little upset. Like, what? <laughs> That's a pretty serious trip, man. I mean, that would be a pretty awesome getaway. Ten grand, come on. Or how about another pair of shoes? I mean, I'm, you know, middle class where I grew up. Um, middle class was actually the low end of the totem pill uh, where, where my high school was. They were kind of a 90210 of Lansing, Michigan area. And uh, everybody was dressed to the nines. And then there was me. <laughs> so, so in my head, I'm like, dude, that could have bought me a couple labels or whatever. But you know what? That never really went through my mind. Because I knew that was just my parents' ethos. They said yes to that Jesus thing so many years ago, ways to walk with God. And that yes translated into it's going to affect how we spend our money. And so because I caught that, that's been a part of my life and Lynn and I's life uh, together. A regular giving to the work of the church. Even though it's the church that pays me, it sounds weird, but it's important because that's the yes Jesus thing. It re-ligaments the whole thing. And I, taught, I was taught that not through a class that they offered, but because I caught it from their example. 
I don't know if you're catching this yet, but who you are as a person is your actual theology lived out. Regardless of what comes across your lips, who you are as a person screams your actual, genuine, lived out theology. And I was seeing a model lived out before me 24-7. And the next uh, slide, what are we looking at here? Ah, American Baptist girls. So my mom uh, was mostly stay-at-home mom. Uh, she did some volunteer stuff here and there. And one of the things that she loved uh, to volunteer with was uh, American Baptist women. So American Baptist, that's our tribe uh, that we hail from. Still are a part of that here at Crosswalk. It's a very broad, um, really, I'm very proud of American Baptist and who we are. Um, they used to have a thing. Uh, what, was the, what was the program, Lynn, called uh, for girls? Guild Girls, that's right. And Lynn was a part of that. And actually, I think Lynn even met my mom uh, at a Guild Girls retreat kind of a thing because my mom uh, was a part of that. And my mom knew Lynn's sisters and all that because we were kind of growing up in the same neck of the woods at that time. Um, the point is, is that I would see my mom with lots of extra time that she could spend on anything she wanted. But the things she chose to invest most of her time in were related to that yes to Jesus thing so long ago. That was just normal uh, for her. And that became normal for us. So when opportunities came up for us to serve, it wasn't like, oh, can I fit it in? It was just, well, yeah. Because if you say yes to Jesus back there, it's going to translate into a yes to Jesus here. It's just what you do. It's part of the thing. And I learned that from them, watching them devote countless hours. And by the way, always, <laughs> I don't understand this, but always with a good attitude. They would put... I mean, my mom for American Baptist Women conventions and stuff that she would be a part of, she would make these elaborate banners. I mean, pieces of art. These things were gorgeous. Uh, people would be snapping pictures with them at the Green Lake Conference Center with her banners. They were unbelievable. She would spend weeks and weeks and weeks on this thing. And I would never hear her moan and groan about it. I'd only hear her excited about it, about what she hoped that it would convey to the convention. Well, that rubbed off on all of us kids. All of us kids now, we're all grown up. Um, well, I don't know if we're all grown up, but we're all aged. <laughs> I don't know if I'm grown up yet. I hope I never do in some respects. Uh, but all of us, because of what we saw in my folks, I think, the proverb came true. Uh, because all of us are committed to our faith, deeply committed to our faith. And I can say with great confidence that my siblings, if you meet them uh, on the street or whatever, they're not going to be jerks. <laughs> they're going to be nice people. Which leads to the final uh, thing, I wanna, the next to the final thing I want to show you on the next slide, which is this cat, this caterpillar bulldozer. When I think of a caterpillar bulldozer, I think about Dan Exo. You don't know Dan Exo because uh, you're not from northern Michigan, but we had a, this hunter's cabin uh, that my folks picked up for a song probably with some of that inheritance money, up in northern Michigan. And so I would spend my summers up there on the beach of uh, one of the bays of Lake Michigan. The, the background on the, this community of, of old hunter's cabins, sort of refurbished, uh, was a, a family had um, a bunch of siblings that together they bought a string of places, property on the same beach, and then a couple other people who also happened to be very committed to their faith uh, bought also. So you had a community of like, I don't know, 10 lots or so strung along together, and they're all deeply committed Christian people. So that was reflected in all the potlucks and stuff they do on the beach. All these Christian people, very devout and very conservative, by the way, in the way that they live that out. And then there was Dan Exo. Dan Exo's mom was Catholic, didn't see the world through a Baptist lens. <laughs> and raised her son accordingly. Dan was a good man. Uh, Dan owned a dealership at the south end of Traverse City, Michigan. Sold a smattering of cars, but his favorite thing to deal in was this kind of stuff. Big equipment. Uh, that he'd always have something sitting on his lot. And he told my dad one time that if there's a heaven and if he gets to go, heaven's going to be pushing around sand with a bulldozer. <laughs> so if we get there someday and it looks pretty level, well, we have someone to thank. <laughs> it's Dan. He found his tractor. Well, anyway, um, nobody cared for Dan a lot on the beach. 
for years, decades. And Dan knew it. Dan knew it. And after a while, he got to a point where he just didn't care. You see, Dan, not growing up in a conservative Baptist uh, lifestyle, he did not know that it was a cardinal sin to smoke a cigarette. And he liked to smoke. And one time, actually many times, he had the audacity, if you can believe this, on his own property, on a hot summer day, he was known on occasion, most of the time, to drink a cold beer. Can you believe it? <laughs> how is the son of Satan living on this beach? That's what everybody wanted to know. And that's how he felt. But my parents had a different gaze. And my dad is the kind of guy that if you ever meet him and talk with him, and if you have met him, you already know this to be true, you're going to feel good about that interaction. And you're going to feel better after having been in a conversation with him than before you got into a conversation with him. Because that's the kind of gregarious guy he is. And so when he sees a neighbor who he has to interact with and would anyway, dad was just dad. And he just did his dad thing and walked alongside him and treated him like a normal human being and didn't judge him for his smoking and his beer drinking thing. In fact, my dad, knowing who my dad is, he would probably ask a gazillion questions about what kind of beer does he drink? Not that my dad has any care about that at all and has probably had one sip of beer in his whole life. He's going to do that to engage Dan in relationship because that's my dad. And he taught. And my mom did the same thing in numerous ways throughout her life. When she would see somebody who was isolated, I remember about this, uh, this guy named Zhao Ya, uh, who was from Burma. And he lived, he came over to our country to learn um, some theology so he could go back and be a pastor there. Totally alone in the world. My mom saw that. You know, our family wrapped our arms around him so that he would not be alone uh, in a cold winter in Michigan and got to know him uh, well. These kinds of things, these are, are acts of incarnation coming alongside. Neither of my parents said at any time, okay, kids, this is what we're going to do because the Bible says blah, 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 blah. It was just, we said yes to Jesus way back then. Following Jesus means we come alongside people who need it the most. And so here we go. It means not judging people based on uh, what you see as the appearance of things. So let's embrace Dan Exo and get to know this guy. And you know what? That relationship was redemptive for that household. They felt welcomed. They felt loved and appreciated. Because our family loved and appreciated them. It caught. It re-ligamented things. It gave Dan hope in a world that had judged him severely. What does that do if you're a kid? You look at that, you put the pieces together, you say, this is somebody who's trying to live their life deeply in faith and taking that very seriously. It translates into how they spend their money, how they spend their time, how they do relationship, how they do service, who they come alongside, how they handle conflict and grace. They didn't teach us with a manual. Sunday school didn't teach us that. Their lives taught us that. The last thing, and this is one that is only recently becoming a thing that is uh, acceptable in our culture, but still very difficult. On this next slide, you have a picture of a closet, and it refers to skeletons in the closet. Now, both of my parents grew up in um, Dutch-slash-German households that were fairly stoic and didn't share a lot of emotion and wanted to keep a pretty good veneer. Uh, so that people would know they were good upstanding people. That's just the way it was, and I think a whole generation sort of uh, lived that way, and I think that bled right into my father's generation. And so uh, to talk about uh, hardships or failure or whatever, you just really didn't bring those things up. You didn't have conversations about those things. Now we're learning that there's actually great value to doing that, that there's great value in being vulnerable. There's actually strength in it. While it looks at the face like, oh, if I'm vulnerable, if I kind of talk about my shortcomings, my failures, my hurts, my wounds, that somebody's going to think I'm weak. But actually the data says that that actually confers strength in the eye of the people that we're being vulnerable with, not weakness. And so as we're going forward, I'm thinking, how can I reflect this act of saying yes to Jesus with my own children? And it's difficult to do. 
But if there was anybody who was vulnerable, it was Jesus. I mean, the guy was born at the low end of the totem pole in terms of financial success, career, all that stuff. Born to a poor father and mother. Born in a barn. I mean, come on. Uh, and I don't think he ever forgot it. I grew up in Roman-occupied Israel. Watched people with a lot more money, throwing it in his face and other people's faces, using that power and all that. But I don't think he ever forgot where he came from. And I think that vulnerability is what allowed him to come alongside everybody that everybody else didn't want to be around. Lepers, tax collectors, people with a past. And I don't know what skeletons Jesus would talk about, but he certainly helped people talk about theirs. And I hope that I can help my kids know that that's part of the yes Jesus thing as well. That in order to grow and not repeat history, we have to look at where we've been and dialogue about what we were thinking and what happens and what happens now and then, then what happened and how do I unpack that? Because that's where real life is. It's hard because I'm my kid's dad and they've listened to their mother for many years telling them that I am perfect in every way. <laughs> I'm grateful for a wife that does not do that and calls me on my stuff uh, in a healthy way. But I'm still dad, and I still want them to look up to me. I still want, I like that, because I'm dad. And they kind of need that. And so I'm in this weird dance of learning as they are growing in their adulthood to just be an adult right alongside them. And as they go through experiences, share, well, you know, this happened to me, and it was really hard, and it blew me out of the water for a while being vulnerable with them teaches them another part of the yes to Jesus. And so I'm wondering what you've done with your skeletons. If you just put a lock on the door, if you put a veneer over it, the painful stuff in your life, if you worked it out with anybody, because I think that's part of the yes to Jesus stuff. And I wonder how you're doing that for you parents, how you're doing that with your kids. I want to tell you it's not too late. You don't have to bring up your painful mistakes, but you can start by saying, wow, you know, when I was passed up for that job back in whatever, 1990 something, something, that was really hard on my ego, whatever it is. And somehow I worked through it, and this is kind of what got me through it. You know how helpful that is, how real that makes us when we do that. That's part of the yes thing. I don't know if you've been tracking with this with me. As I was writing down stories this week, just remembering this, then knowing that this is the text. And by the way, that last part about the skeleton in your closet, that's that piece I wanted you to remember from that psalm. Where the psalmist is saying, we're going to remember our mistakes. We're going to remember how those who went before us blew it. They're telling on themselves because they know that's going to be helpful for the next generation. Well, as I was putting all these things together and put them on the table, just looking at them, I realized <laughs> that it looked very familiar to me. So take a look at the next slide, and I'll tell you what I mean. And for you who are crosswalkers, this, is gonna, this should be ringing some bells. That their whole experience started with a choice that led them, whoops, that led them to spill their coffee, that led them uh, to stretch their thinking, and the, and the metaphor I gave you today, stretch their thinking about money, that caused them to kneel in service, that caused them to be graceful in a particularly beautiful way that led them, that one yes led them to connect with God intentionally in some way, that that yes also led them to say yes to being incarnate, walking alongside people in their journey, and that the whole gist of this thing is to resurrect dead things so that they live again. Not only hope for afterlife, but right here and now, seeing things redeemed. If this is ringing bells, it should because this reflects Crosswalk's belief statement and what we do. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. I did not have to have the list in front of my face growing up because I saw it modeled in my own parents. You are modeling for your children and the people you influence what faith your faith is. My question is, is what faith are you modeling? Is it the faith you want to pass down? Or are there parts of your journey that you've been putting a veneer over it, maybe bathing it even in scripture to hide it, that needs to be corrected because it's incongruent with the yes to Jesus. And that, of course, 
leads to your invitation. Because there is one. There was one early on for my parents, and that wasn't the only one. That was one of countless invitations to say yes to the way of Jesus and our seeking God. You are being asked to reference Jennifer's song to come to the table. You are being asked to make a decision that Jesus is present in spirit with us even now, inviting you, come and follow me. Come and follow this path, which is going to lead you to a deeper relationship with God, which is going to look a whole lot like that, and it's going to be good for you, the people around you, the whole world. I'm inviting you into that, says Jesus, by the power of the Spirit. What is your answer? Because the invitation is clear. Let's pray together. So, God, uh, my experience with you is that there is always an invitation. In our tradition here at Crosswalk, that's an invitation to see you, to follow you through the lens of Jesus. To model our lives off of his life. How he thought, how he embraced you, how he embraced others. And so when we say yes to that, we're really saying yes to following you, to being united with you, to allowing you to re-ligament us, to remember us, that we would be whole people, connected with those around us and all connected with you. God, if there's any part of our real faith, which is actually lived out more than what we speak, that we know we need to correct, then God, I pray that your spirit just bring that to our attention now and say, well, which way do you want to go here? Do you want to go a yes with me or a yes to that? And I pray that we would make a decision even now which way to go, knowing that there will be countless more decisions to come. May your spirit lead us. May your spirit continue to invite us. Then when it does, may we say yes. In Jesus' name, amen.